We are also working at the Temple of Medina Tabu. Of course, this is one of our, our major sites. It's been, uh, it was the site first selected for us to work on in 1924 by Professor Breasted. We have an ongoing tradition of work here at Medina Habu. We have published numerous volumes of epigraphic material, particularly concerning the Mortuary Temple of Ramses III, the Great Mortuary Temple, along with the Eastern Highgate, the Ramesid uh, period monuments from this temple. But here in the foreground, you can see uh, the smaller temple, the 18th Dynasty Temple, dating from the reign of Hatshepsut and Tuthmosis III, with later additions. The 18th Dynasty Temple has been a major focus of our work uh, for the last several years. We have produced already one volume uh, on the reliefs and inscriptions of this small temple. We're continuing that program. I'll talk more about that in a moment. We are also actively working on the tomb chapels of the 25th dynasty, God's Wives of Amun, that you can see here on the left side of the screen. Uh, God's Wives of Amun are high-ranking female clergy members of the cult of Amun at Karnak. And these buildings were their tombs, subterranean tombs with superstructures, tomb chapels built on top. Uh, highly decorated, very beautiful relief carving. So they're quite significant monuments. Uh, and over the past couple of seasons, we've devoted a lot of time and effort to the initial photographic documentation of those monuments, as I'll tell you in a moment. We also have an extensive conservation program throughout the Medinat Habu complex that I'll describe and other documentation programs associated with that. So I will start off by giving you an overview of the site. You see the main mortuary complex of Ramses III in the center, the stone temple surrounded by the subsidiary buildings, the Eastern High Gate, which gives you the entrance to the complex, the area of the Western Fortified Gate, which I'll talk about a little bit later. You have the 18th Dynasty Temple here to the east with the later additions. And here are the chapels of the God's Wives of Amun, just to give you a spatial overview of where these things are located within the complex. Now, within the 18th Dynasty Temple, we are actively working on drawings, facsimile documentation. I mentioned that we have already published one volume of reliefs and inscriptions from this temple. That's Medina Habu Volume 9, which was the inner sanctuaries of the temple. We have recently completed our manuscript for Medina Habu Volume 10, and that volume is now ready for press. It will be published uh, by the Oriental Institute. And then we are actively working on the facsimile documentation for Medina Habu 11, Volume 12, and Volume 13. So I'll go over with you what each of those volumes contains. Again, Medina Habu 9, uh, the volume concerning the inner sanctuaries, that was OIP 136. It concerned the six inner chambers of the interior, which were decorated during the reign of Hatshepsut and Tuthmosis III. So those of you who would like to look at that publication, you can actually download it from the Oriental Institute Publications website along with all of uh, the Oriental Institute's other publications that are available in PDF form. The next volume, Medina Tabu Volume 10, will concern the peripteral pillars going around the ambulatory in the outer part of the 18th Dynasty Temple, carved primarily during the reign of Tuthmosis III, including some very beautiful uh, vestiges of the original Tuthmosid paint, uh, as well as the outer facade of the 18th Dynasty Temple. Uh, so this is a forthcoming volume. We hope to have that available for you within the next year or two. Things have been a little bit delayed by the current situation, uh, but we hope to move that forward very, very soon towards publication. The next volume, Medina Tabu Volume 11, will concern the exterior scenes of the 18th Dynasty Temple, 
which were carved primarily during the reign of Ramses III, but also during dynasties 21, dynasty 25, and dynasty 29, with later additions to the outer parts of the 18th dynasty temple. Medina Tabu volume 12 will include the publication of the inner bark shrine, which was again decorated during the reign of Tuthmosis III, but extensively recarved and redecorated during the Ptolemaic period during the reign of Ptolemy VIII. Um, now, our facsimile drawings or photographs and facsimile drawings for Medinet Habu Volume 11 and Medinet Habu Volume 12 are well advanced. We do have quite a bit of field work left to do, but we hope that by the time Medinet Habu 10 appears in print. Uh, we'll be in the process of preparing volume 11 for publication, and then volume 12 will appear in due course. Within the last couple of field seasons, we have also initiated our work on Medina Tabu volume 13, which will include the uh, 25th dynasty pylon, the Kushite pylon, uh, the two gateways uh, on the north exterior of the small temple complex, and then the late period portico located in front of the small pylon. Uh, so we are uh, at the beginning of this process, but we've already completed a number of uh, photographic survey and a number of facsimile drawings from the various uh, components of this part of the small temple. Uh, so this is one of the volumes that will appear in the future. And then after that, we'll move on to the latest phases of the monument, the Ptolemaic and Roman material. Uh, so this is to give you an idea of our publication program. Again, uh, the purpose of the epigraphic survey is to record and to preserve this material by means of accurate facsimile recording and publication. Uh, so we are continuing this core uh, mission, Luxor Temple, and here at Medina Tabu. Now, in addition to the formal relief carving that is preserved in the monuments of Medina Tabu, uh, there are also extensive graffiti, thousands and thousands of graffiti of various periods, hieratic, demotic, coptic, figurative graffiti that are preserved within the Medina Tabu complex. For the past several seasons, uh, our Egyptologist, uh, Christina de Cherbo, has been recording this material um, here using a tablet computer in the field. This is an important component of the history of the monument. Uh, they give us a lot of historical information about what went on here, not just the formal relief carving, but the people who worked here, the priests, uh, their records, their prayers, things that they drew while they were relaxing on the roof of the temple. So this is an ongoing uh, recording process. Again, creating a series of layered drawings in Adobe Photoshop that allow the various stages of informal decoration or graffiti to be recorded. You can see here a good example of that. This is a layered Photoshop drawing that shows the various stages that you can see in the decoration of one wall. Uh, the earliest material here are a series of demotic graffiti dating to the first century BC, first century AD. Uh, over this, uh, during the Christian period, you can see there was a, a series of Coptic fresco paintings. There are actually three different stages of uh, Christian period fresco paintings represented on this wall surface. And uh, the Adobe Photoshop layers allow us to distinguish the various phases of this material. You can show one phase, you can show another phase, or you can show all of the phases juxtaposed with each other as in this example. So it's given us a lot of flexibility in how we record and how we can ultimately represent and publish this material as well. Now, I mentioned previously uh, the tomb chapels of the gods' wives of Amun. You can see here another view, as well as an excellent um, reconstruction prepared by our architect, Uwe Holscher, in the 1930s. These tomb chapels are uh, architecturally complex, and they have not previously been recorded uh, in any uh, accurate way in a facsimile method. So um, we are 
now doing the initial photographic survey of these chapels, there have been a number of technical challenges to the photographic documentation of these tomb chapels because they are quite small scale. Uh, the space within them is quite narrow. Uh, so our photographers, Yarko Kobolecki and Amanda Tato, have developed a method whereby carefully measured large format film images can be taken of these surfaces using a special lens that is distortion free has allowed us to get very very high quality uh, photographic record of this material and when these photographic images are uh, joined together they give an extraordinary image quality of the reliefs as you can see here and these are the photographic images that will ultimately serve as the basis for our facsimile drawings of the reliefs themselves again for the purposes of publication so the god's wife chapels will also ultimately form a couple of volumes of our publication series down the road. And it's very exciting to have reached the stage where we're actually producing the photographic basis for our publication program for these monuments. Now, another important component of our work at Medinat Habu is an extensive program of restoration and site management. We have been doing conservation work at Medinat Habu since the mid-1990s, and it is now required by the Egyptian government that we do conservation work on all the monuments that we're working on. So we're well in sync with that. Since the initial work uh, was begun on the restoration of the monumental structures, our primary source of funding has been USAID Egypt that has enabled us both to begin and, uh, and to expand the conservation program in a very dramatic way. Uh, so we have continued our conservation and conservation training programs over the past couple of seasons. We've made really good progress in spite of uh, the many obstacles uh, that we face in field work. Uh, the focus right now is on the exterior areas of Ramses III's mortuary temple. As you can see here, these are photographs that were taken prior to the completion of conservation work in these areas, you can see that on the exterior of the King's Mortuary Temple, there are the remains of a sandstone pavement that ultimately ran around the entire temple exterior. Um, this is an area full of archeological remains, that are very much deteriorated. And it's in, it was in such a state that it was really impossible for people to visit this area safely. So we developed a program with USAID Egypt to restore and to conserve the exterior structures immediately outside of the mortuary temple in order to preserve the historic structures themselves, but also to allow easier visitor access to the exterior areas of the temple. As some of you may know, the outsides of uh, Ramses III's mortuary temple are covered with very, very interesting historical reliefs, battle reliefs, uh, the narratives of Ramses III's victories over various peoples who tried to invade Egypt, as well as the great calendar of offerings on the south side. So it's important for visitors to be able to access these areas safely. And that is one of the core components of our restoration program that's ongoing right now. Now I'll give you an overview. This is an aerial view here of the exterior of the temple. You can see the archeological remains, uh, the mud brick remains just peeking up from the surface. We want to allow the visitors to view these remains, but we want to create access in such a way that they don't actually walk on top of them and cause further deterioration. So the restoration of the paved walkway that originally existed right here on the outside of the temple is a way for us to accomplish that. For the past several years, we have been working first here on the south side and then continuing on the west side of the temple to restore, restore the sandstone pavement. You can see here some of our stone masonry team at work preparing and fitting the sandstone slabs into the surface uh, in order to create a, uh, a realistic restoration of what the ancient pavement would have been in a way that's true to the original materials. At the same time, we have undertaken a program of restoring the 
uh, adjoining mud brick structures as well. We have a team that manufactures mud bricks that are the same uh, size and shape as the original mud bricks uh, in order to do a historically accurate restoration of these mud brick uh, administrative structures adjoining the temple. Uh, each of our modern bricks is stamped with the University of Chicago seal. You may be able to see the little U of C stamp on each of these bricks as they're being manufactured by our brick-making team. And then our conservation team uh, is reconstructing the lower courses of these mud brick buildings, again, in order to place the material in context to protect and preserve the underlying mud brick foundations, uh, but also to provide a pathway for visitors who would like to go around and visit the exterior areas of the temple. Uh, here you see the restored, the, the, the results of this program. This is a restored sandstone pavement along the south side of the exterior of the Ramses III Mortuary Temple. You can see very clearly the difference between the old fragment uh, uh, paving slabs that are still in place. We've done our best to preserve and to restore the original paving stones what we can. But you can also see the lighter colored uh, restoration stones. We've done our best to, to restore them in such a way that is true to the ancient stonework. And this design is primarily the work of our master mason, Frank Helmholtz. Our conservation team that has been in charge of restoring and conserving the adjoining mud brick structures has been under the direction of our head conservator, Lutfi Hassan. And they have worked together to create a very good restoration, a very effective restoration of this part of the exterior of Ramses III's mortuary complex in such a way that really facilitates visitor access. So this is the south part of the paved walkway and the adjoining mud brick structures. Um, this material was completed during our 2018-2019 field season. We have now proceeded around the corner and completed the western uh, part of the pavement directly behind the temple as well. And during the most recent two seasons, we've moved around to the north exterior side of Ramses III's Mortuary Temple. Our goal is over the next couple of years to complete the restoration of the mud brick structures and the stone pavement all the way around the temple exterior so that the visitor now has a complete circuit uh, and can safely visit the exterior portions of the monument. And again, we're very grateful to USAID Egypt for providing the funding for what is a very large scale uh, and very materially intensive restoration program. Now, we have entered a new phase of our USAID-funded restoration efforts, and we're moving on to some of the other components of Medina Habu uh, that are in need of restoration. One of the things that we focused on during the past season was this structure, as you can see here on the left. It is part of a gateway on just outside of the temple exterior at the southeast corner that was built during the reign of the Roman Emperor Claudius. Uh, it's in a very, very bad condition. You can see that the lower stones have deteriorated. Only one door jam is preserved. The other door jam is uh, completely in ruins. Um, but this structure was in danger of collapse, as you can see. So with our USAID funding, we have been able to start the restoration of the structure. Um, basically, what we're going to do is essentially take it apart block by block. You can see here at the top right, Frank and the stonemasonry team have erected a large scaffolding that has enabled the Claudius gate to be dismantled. Each of these blocks has been taken inside the Medina Habu complex to our blockyard storage area, as you can see here at the lower right. Um, they've been placed on temporary storage platforms, uh, and Lutfi and our conservation team will supervise the consolidation and restoration of each of the inscribed and structural blocks of this gate. Next season, we will begin the process of creating a new foundation for this structure. 
uh, the conservation of the blocks themselves will be completed. And ultimately, we will re-erect the restored blocks on a new foundation in a way that will enable the structure to be uh, preserved for the future and included within the visitor itinerary of the Medina Hubbard Temple. And so this is uh, something that has uh, just been started right at the beginning of 2020 and something that we hope to continue uh, next season when we return to fieldwork in Luxor. Now, as part of our uh, large-scale restoration efforts, we have, over the past many years now, uh, each season undertaken a conservation training program for religious and conservation students. These are generally young university graduates who have just graduated from the local universities with conservation degrees. Uh, we essentially provide them with a work practicum that will give them practical on uh, hands-on field experience doing various conservation techniques. Again, Lutfi Hassan is in charge of this program. He instructs these young conservators in a variety of different conservation techniques, uh, stone consolidation, uh, the cleaning of decorated surfaces, mud brick uh, consolidation and restoration, uh, a lot of the various uh, skills and techniques that they will need uh, in the future to have careers in uh, cultural heritage conservation. Now, in addition to providing them with training, they also form the core of our conservation team, uh, undertaking the physical conservation of the monuments themselves. And so, again, this is funded by USAID Egypt, uh, and it's an important part of our conservation program on site at Medina Tabu. Now, another component of our USAID funded restoration program. Uh, is the Western High Gate of Ramses III. Now, I will point out here on the map, we have the photo at left and the map here on the right, the Eastern Fortified Gate, which is a great monumental structure that forms the entrance to Ramses III's Mortuary Temple. In ancient times, there was a corresponding gateway located on the west end of the temple complex, a fortified gateway and palace complex. At the end of the New Kingdom, this gateway was destroyed during a time of civil unrest within Egypt, and its blocks were thrown down, later buried over by later archaeological strata. But this was a major component of uh, Ramses III's complex at Medina Tabu. This is an overview of what it looks like today. You can see the huge stone blocks uh, scattered throughout the area of what was the Western Fortified Gate. You can also see the extensive mud brick structures, uh, the adjoining walls and foundations of the mud brick palace dating to the time of Ramses III, as well as a number of walls dating to later periods, the Roman and Coptic periods, located here on the west side of the Great Mortuary Temple. So as part of our uh, program here at Medina Habu in 2015, uh, we initiated a program to record, to analyze, and to study this material, which had never been recorded previously. So uh, this is a complete documentation program, start to finish. Uh, it is directed by uh, Dr. Jen Kempton, uh, who is responsible for the, for the analysis of this material. And the drawings have been done by Kelly Alberts, a very skilled field artist. We have now uh, well over a thousand fragments from the Western Highgate that we've recorded, both large and small size. Uh, we do have some archival photographic material taken by um, the Oriental Institute Architectural Survey in the 1930s as well. But by and large, there is no previous documentation for most of these fragments. Our Western Highgate database enables this material to be sorted, classified, analyzed, and it is already allowing some very interesting joins and reconstructions to be made. The decoration of the Western Highgate uh, is... Uh, shows an interesting duality. The exterior scenes are primarily scenes of the victorious 
King Ramses III conquering his enemies, as you can see here at the top left. They are the remains of a great chariot scene in which the king is in his chariot with his great bow shooting arrows at his enemies, and the enemies are being trampled under uh, his horse's hoofs at the bottom of the scene. You can see a fragment here at the lower left, uh, showing the defeated enemies of the king. The interior scenes are of a completely different character. They show Ramses III at leisure with the female members of the royal court, uh, eating and drinking and relaxing and basically having a good time in the domestic context of the palace. This duality of the nature of the scenes is reflected in the Eastern Highgate, which is very well preserved. So we can use the Eastern Highgate as a model for uh, thematic reconstruction of the decoration here at the Western Highgate. Now Kelly has created a number, already created a number of very, very high quality reconstructions. You can see here a reconstruction of the great chariot scene in which Ramses III is, uh, is in battle against his enemies. In this case, the uh, he is on a Nubian campaign, defeating uh, his enemies in Nubia. And because of the numerous parallels for victory scenes of this type, it's possible to take this fragmentary material and arrive at a pretty accurate reconstruction, place a lot of the smaller fragments. Um, and it's going to give us an idea of the overall decorative scheme of the exterior. Kelly Alberts has also created this um, conjectural reconstruction of what the exterior of the gate would have looked like. This would be from the outside looking into the temple complex toward the east. And as you can see, it's been possible based just on the small number, relatively small number of fragments uh, to reconstruct a very good idea of what the decorative scheme of these towers would have been. Uh, not only the great battle scenes, but also the upper register decoration consisting mm -hmm. of Names and titles of the king presented uh, in a rebus manner and a number of commemorative inscriptions as well. Um, so this has been a major focus of our work over the last several years. It's important to note that when we are in the field studying this material, it's not just a matter of recording the decorated surfaces of the blocks. Our team has made an extensive study of the uh, three-dimensional characteristics of the blocks themselves because they do go together in three dimensions. And the various architectural clues, the measurements, the, uh, the mortise and tenon emplacements, um, the undecorated surfaces, all of these things give us information about how the groups of blocks go together. As you can see here, uh, very high quality three-dimensional reconstructions by Jen Kempton have enabled these fragment groups to be analyzed and pieced together in three dimensions. And that is helping to give us an idea of how this fragmentary material went together in order to reconstruct to the best of our ability uh, the original structure. We have also been helped in the past couple of years by the development of some 3D reconstruction software. Uh, we can use the 3D uh, photogrammetry technique to create these digital models of the fragments in three dimensions. And these can then be pieced together in order to test joins and to analyze the material uh, to give a better idea of how it all went together. Uh, we're really grateful to Ariel Singer for helping us out uh, in creating these three-dimensional models. So it's really uh, allowing us to reconstruct this fragmentary, fragmentary material in a way that was never possible to do before. We have also used uh, the technique of 3D photogrammetric mapping to map the mudbrick structures of the Western Highgate. Again, it's a process of taking a number of digital photographs from various directions. These photographs are then fed into a software program called Metashape Pro. And that creates a three-dimensional model of the various surfaces. So with time and patience and quite a bit of data crunching on the back end, it's possible to create highly accurate three-dimensional uh, 
digital maps of this area. And this is giving us an important record of the current state of the site. We have uh, had the privilege of having uh, with us archaeologists Nadine Muller and Greg Marur, who have conducted some preliminary test excavations of the area. And the 3D photogrammetric mapping is an important component of the archaeological work that has been done. Uh, we anticipate that there's going to be extensive archaeological investigation in this area in the future as well. So it's good to have this source of data that allows us to do that in a more accurate way. For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu member.